updated concussion guidelines as of June 2023. So every so often they do a consensus statement through a conference. So this last one was done in Amsterdam 2022, and they just published it once again. I believe it was yesterday. So it's very, very new. And I'm wanting to review that with you. So I'm going to share my screen because there's a lot of things that people need to understand about concussion. This is a very serious issue. And if we don't understand it right, then we can't expect to get the right diagnosis. So consensus statement on concussion in sport. Now, they went through, they revamped some of it. They added in some other things. Now, there are some key takeaways before I go into the actual diagnosis itself. So one of the big things that's used for pre-season in high schools, colleges, and other things is neurocognitive tests, specifically the impact tests. The results of computerized neurocognitive tests should be interpreted in the context of broader clinical findings and are not to be used in isolation to inform management or diagnostic decisions. So these tests, while they have a place, they have routinely been overly utilized and it causes a lot of harm. Next, what are some other things? Lots of benefits around physical activity and exercise. So the days of just going hiding in a dark room till your symptoms go away has officially been pulled out. It's been pulled out for a couple of years when we look at the research, but in this updated consensus statement, they're definitely arguing against that. Also, using cervical vestibular rehabilitation is indicated, okay? So getting therapy where you're getting vestibular therapy usually is going to involve a combination of vestibular, which is going to be anything balance related, eye movements and cervical spine is indicated, okay? So um, now let's actually go into one of the papers they reference. So this is, put together through a variety of different articles. So one of the articles that they used in deciding everything is the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine Diagnostic Criteria for Mild Traumatic Brain Injury. This was published May of 2023. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to scroll down here as we start seeing what now needs to be done when we're looking at making a diagnosis. So number one is do you have an appropriate mechanism of injury? And we'll dive into what that actually is. If so, you then advance. You need to have either clinical signs, which we will review what those clinical signs are, one or more, or you need the acute symptoms, two or more of those. And there are specific symptoms that we are looking for in that acute phase. And the acute phase is less than 72 hours. Plus, you need clinical examination or lab findings, which we will review what that is. Now, this should be not better accounted for by other things. So for example, if someone's drunk, yes, they're going to fail a lot of the tests you do in the clinical examination. So it came like, oh, well, this person's clearly impaired with alcohol, right? So there cannot be a better explanation for what's going on. And if they have had imaging, which imaging is not required, the imaging should be normal. If it's not normal and there's bleeds or something else, you're actually have left what's going to be most of the MTBI realm and you're going to something more severe than that. So let's scroll down as they talk about what some of these things are. So number one, mechanism of injury. So one of the big myths out there is, do you have to be hit in the head to have suffered a concussion? Now, you can either be hit in the head, two, your head striking a sub object, right? So fights, car accidents, you know, hitting your head, but also brain undergoing an acceleration, deceleration movement without direct contact or even forces generated from a blast or an explosion. So yes, you can have a fall, never hit your head and have an oscillation up your spine that rattles your brain and that does actually cause a MTBI. So 
is there the appropriate mechanism of injury? Yes or no. Now, there does need to be that physical insult with the only one not directly hitting the body per se is going to be a blast injury. Just the shock waves alone can do it. So you have to have that to move to any of the other stages. Now, once you have that, you have to have, actually, you don't have to have, but if you do, then it automatically brings you to that phase of having that MTBI. One, a loss of consciousness. Number two is altered mental status. So, you know, not responsive or, you know, you're just really slow. You're more agitated. You're irritable, disoriented. It's like, hey, where are you at? And they're like, I don't know. Uh, Texas? It's like, no, man, you're, you're not. Um, not remembering the event. Okay. So you can not remember the event because you've lost consciousness or there's even post-traumatic amnesia where people won't fully remember it anyways. Now, seizures, difficulty with standing, tonic posturing, which we all saw to a tag of a law, right? Should have been done at that point in time, automatically concussion done. Now, that alone is enough, those first two. If that second one that I reviewed, the clinical symptoms isn't present, you can still be diagnosed. But here's what we are looking for in these four. An acute subjective alter mental status. So feeling confused, dazed. These are things that you are going to report. Once again, you need two or more of these that are new or worsened. Physical symptoms, headache, nausea, dizziness, balance problems, visual problems. So blurry vision, double vision, light, noise, sensitivity. Cognitive symptoms, feeling slowed down, mental fog, difficulty concentrating, or memory problems. And then lastly, uncharacteristic emotional mobility or even irritability. So you need two symptoms or more to meet criteria. And it is okay if these two symptoms come from the same category. They do not have to be spread out. The onset, okay. Now, once again, these are usually going to occur pretty fast. Um, these may be delayed by a few hours, but they nearly always appear less than 72 hours from the injury. So we are looking at at least having some of these initial symptoms at that point in time. So that would be a checkpoint. Now, this brings us to the evaluation. So cognitive impairment on acute examination. Okay, this could be done with a memory test, whether it's written, verbal, or computerized. Two is balance impairment. If you're playing sports, you should always have your balance testing done beforehand so you know where you're at. Because if, if your balance is really, really good, even if you take an injury, you still may be what people would consider acceptable, even though it's a significant decline for you. Oculomotor impairment. So with this, I recommend using what's called video oculography or video nystagmography. Basically, wearing goggles, it's going to record everything your eyes do. So dysfunction in how you perform that test, or you can actually do well with it. But symptoms that occur when you do this testing is enough as well. And then elevated blood biomarkers indicative of intracranial injury. They're still working on really what some of these best biomarkers are. Um, one of them that's getting a lot of research is a neurofilament light chain. There's other things, MMP9, matrix metallic protein. Um, there's S100B, which is a measure of blood-brain barrier permeability. But you really have to take those in conjunction because there are other things that can cause MMP9 to be elevated. And then lastly, criterion number five is, look, you do not need neuroimaging to diagnosis. The primary role of neuroimaging in concussion is to really make sure if you are worried that there's nothing that requires neurosurgical or other medical intervention in acute setting, okay? Right, if there's a really big, bad bruise on the brain, a bleed, any of that stuff, facial fractures. We really do need to know that. Um, but for most concussions, MTBIs, this will be normal. And then as I mentioned up front about the alcohol is, look, it, it shouldn't be explained by other things, whether it's alcohol abuse, psychological trauma, right? Like, okay, well, I passed out because my blood pressure was just way too low. Well, passing out doesn't necessarily cause a concussion. Right. So that shouldn't be considered a loss of consciousness and say you have a concussion unless you pass out 
you hit your head, you have a jolt, and then you get those acute symptoms that we have talked about. So, you know, there's more in here if you really want to go through it. This is the updated guidelines from the consensus statement on how a diagnosis for a concussion should be done. So if you've been told you have a concussion and you haven't actually been through something similar to this, we actually can't say that's a great diagnosis because you haven't followed along with the criteria. On the other side, if you've been told you don't have a concussion, but yet you meet those criteria we've talked about, there's a good chance you may have actually been given a bad diagnosis. We know in studies in the US up words of 50% of concussion diagnoses are missed in the emergency room. There was a study in Israel that found 25% of pediatrics, so under the age of 17, that had suffered a concussion weren't diagnosed, even though they should have been when they looked at the chart review, and they were given other diagnoses instead, such as ADHD, depression, anxiety, and insomnia. So this is the updated. Um, if you'd like to learn more, I do have other videos. If you'd like to work with me, you may contact my office through using the information on this YouTube link, Idaho Brain and Body. Dot com. And until next time, this is Dr. Z.